Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. What is the most famous Mexican novella? You're probably right. It's probably Pedro Paramo. But today I want to call your attention to another one, a very important one. It's a little book that was published in 1915 and that after all those years, more than a century now, it has lost none of its power. I am referring to Los de Abajo or The Underdogs by Mariano Azuela. This is the most famous fictional text about the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And I read it for the first time many years ago when I was in college. I read it in Spanish, of course, because I was taking a course on the literature of the Mexican Revolution. But a few weeks ago, I found out that at my local library they had this really nice copy of a translation in English and I was like what a wonderful excuse to read it again to experience it in another language and to share my thoughts on it with you it's not like I need excuses to do that but it's always nice when you find a very good one and I think this is the case so let me tell you very very briefly some details about the author we're not gonna spend a lot of time with this Mariano Azuela was born in Mexico in 1873 he was a doctor throughout his life and when the Mexican Revolution happened in 1910 the following year he joined a fighting unit of one of Pancho Villa's generals and he was actually the only doctor on duty in that fighting unit he was very prolific he wrote many many novels he wrote some theater also some plays but by far his most famous work is Los de Abajo or The Underdogs that is his most studied text Finally, he passed away also in Mexico in the year 1952. Now we're going to look at the novella, we're going to look at the publication context and also a little bit about the structure. So it turns out that in 1915, Azuela had to take refuge in the city of El Paso, Texas. And that is where he finished writing Los de Abajo and where the novella was published for the first time. It was published first in a periodical and then the following year, 1916, the same people who published it in the periodical published it in book form. So this is a novel really from 1915 but published as a book in 1916. So you might see different dates when it comes to the publication. The novella then was written basically in the thick of the struggle. You could say that the experience was quite fresh in Azuela's mind because it was basically going on as he wrote and as he published the novella. It's a very brief text. Okay, If you look at my original edition, the one in Spanish, it is 120 pages here. This edition has a lot of extra uh, stuff. And in the English one, it is actually less than 100 pages. So it's a very, very powerful text. It's quite compact. It consists of 42 chapters divided into three parts of unequal length. The long longest part is by far the first one. The last one is kind of almost like an epilogue, almost. And the chapters are very brief. So like many novellas, this is something that you have heard me say before, the structure here is episodic. Okay, we have these little chapters, so the effect is really, really quite powerful here. I think this is one of the best novellas that I have read in terms of how the structure fits what the author is trying to convey. Not only the story itself, but the effect that he is trying to provoke in, in the reader. So, the premise and the characters, okay? The Underdogs is basically the story about a revolutionary fighting unit. We do have a protagonist, however, and that is Demetrio Macias, who at the beginning, in the very first chapter, what he has to do is he has to leave his home with his wife and his child, and he joins 25 men with whom he is fighting in the Mexican Revolution. So the novella basically follows these revolutionaries as they encounter the federales or the government soldiers. They fight with them and also they interact with the locals at several small towns as they continue to traverse the Mexican territory. Now, something that is characteristic of the novella as a genre is the fact that you can see it here in Los de Abajo or The Underdogs. There is really no plot, but just a series of vignettes. And in this case, not always in the novella, but in this case, there are lacunae or gaps between the vignettes that 
to me uh, function almost like the typical jump cuts that you can have in a film for example when I was reading it thinking of the structure I thought of Breathless that movie by Godard right where you see those jump cuts it was kind of a revolutionary technique at the time uh, you can see it definitely in this novel and you have those little gaps between the vignettes and the effect is really quite powerful because it gives you a very fast paced narrative if you look at the first chapter, okay, and, and I want to say this, this is probably a challenge. I would say read the first chapter and see if you can stop reading this novella after that. It's an amazing first chapter. It really keeps you interested. And what we encounter here is Demetrio living with his wife and his baby, right, his little child that they have. And all of a sudden the federales come in and they just start acting like they own the place, they shoot his dog, they try to assault his wife. And this is really the type of incident that made many people support the revolution. And when I say people in this case I mean like the, the common people, right? They It was not a matter of ideology or anything like that. It was just a reaction to the abuse on the part of the government forces in this case. Octavio Paz said that the Mexican Revolution was uh, the result of a desire for land, okay? And you can see, for example, if you look at the name of the character or the protagonist in Los de Abajo, Demetrio, right? So Demeter was the goddess of agriculture. So you can see the connection right there. This is a novella that has lots of symbolism throughout, even in the names of the characters. And you can see that in this first chapter. The reason why I stop on this first chapter is because it's really, it really gives you an idea of how well written this novella is, just by reading that one. And then the family trying to escape, right? This is another type of symbolism that you find here. The first thing that I thought about when I pictured that image was of course the flight to Egypt and the Holy Family because you have a man a woman and the child I think this is deliberate right so little details it's it's a very carefully written text and that's what I like about it one of the many things that I enjoy about Lo de Abajo regarding the structure going back a little bit to that I like to think here of the concept of intertwining because you could say that the underdogs is the intertwining of the beauty and the tranquility of nature and then on the other hand the brutality of man and you can see this throughout the novella it's really a very nice interlacing of these two elements there are violent episodes throughout but then at one point you'll suddenly come upon a description like this one it says the river rushed along singing in tiny cascades birds chirped hidden in the pitayos and the rhythmic hum of cicadas filled the solitude of the mountain with mystery. Now let me read you that in Spanish so that you can see how it sounds and uh, you'll see why I'm telling you that this is very carefully written and uh, very poetic also in its descriptions. So what I just read, this is how it sounds in Spanish. El río se arrastraba cantando en diminutas cascadas. Los pajarillos piaban escondidos en los pitayos y las chicharras monorítmicas llenaban de misterio la soledad de la montaña. Notice those sounds, right? El río se arrastraba. And then you have los pajarillos piaban escondidos en los pitayos. And finally, las chicharras monorítmicas. So it's telling you about the river, about the cicadas, about the birds, okay? And you hear the river, you hear the cicadas, you can hear the birds because the words are so well chosen. There's that onomatopoeic quality to the language. And that's what I mean. I'm just reading you one sentence, okay? One little paragraph that is only one sentence but you can find examples of that throughout this text so I think that that excellent combination of poetic description and also the realistic dialogue that Mariano Azuela is able to capture it also made me think of John Steinbeck because for example in a text like of mice and men that's what he does he gives you this very vivid description and then most of it is dialogue he was training himself to write theater when he wrote Of Mice and Men, by the way. And Mariano Azuela was very close to the theater, especially towards the latter part of his life. So the underdogs, really, because of this, right, the intertwining that I was uh, mentioning before, is really a very good exercise in point and counterpoint. So that's another thing to kind of consider when you experience this novella. We have a double perspective in this text also. There are many important characters that you're going to find in the underdogs, 
besides, of course, the protagonist, Demetrio Macias. And I think the most important one of those characters is a guy by the name of Luis Cervantes. He joins the fighting unit in the maybe the fifth or the sixth chapter. It's very close to the beginning of the novella. So if you have, on the one hand, Demetrio as the fighter, we have Luis Cervantes as the ideologue. Okay, he is the guy who thinks about the ideals of the revolution. He used to be a journalist, okay, so he's the figure of the writer, Luis Cervantes. Okay, that, that Cervantes right there is, is not a coincidence, okay, it's meant to make us think of the figure of a writer. And I think also there's a lot of Mariano Azuela, the author of the novella, in this character of Luis Cervantes. Remember that he joined the fighting unit as a doctor, so he was somebody who was educated, unlike the men who were simply the fighters, right? So this is another aspect of this novella in which you can see the contrast right there. You have the fighter versus the, the guy who is always playing with the ideas and stuff like that. So let me read you uh, so that you can get a sense of this contrast right here. There's a part where um, Cervantes, Luis Cervantes is talking to Demetrio Macias and Cervantes says, we are part of a great social movement that can conclude only with the advancement of our homeland. We're destiny's instruments for the vindication of the people's sacred rights. We're not fighting to bring down a lowly assassin, but against tyranny itself. That's what's called fighting for principles, having ideals. That's what Visha, Natera, Carranza are fighting for. That's what we are fighting for as well. Yes, yes, exactly what I've been thinking, said Venancio enthusiastically. And then Demetrio says, Pancrasio, bring us a couple more beers. So you have the contrast right there, the ideas, the, the lofty ideals of the revolution and all that, and then the idea, you know, just bring us some beers, you know, that's, let's not talk about this complicated stuff right here. So because of this, Asuela had some trouble, really, when he was writing and trying to publish the novella. Many people told him, your text is going to be condemned, basically, as reactionary. And you know how Asuela responded to that? He said, it's not going to be condemned as reactionary because it is not. This is just the truth. So that's his approach to that uh, aspect of the writing of this great novella. Regarding women, okay, I think we need to talk about this. There are many women in Los de Abajo, but unfortunately we don't really see them as fighters. For example, if you look at Demetrio's wife, she stays at home with their child while Demetrio is fighting. Then the second important female character that we meet um, at the beginning also of the novella is Camila. Okay, Camila has feelings for Demetrio and she may also have feelings for Luis Cervantes. So we have a little bit of a romantic conflict right there. And then towards the end of the story we encounter another female character, La Pintada. She is a prostitute. Okay, she has feelings also for Demetrio, so there's a little bit of a jealousy going on right there between La Pintada and Camila. But I would say, you know, even if we consider all this, yes, women are depicted, they are a part of this novel, even though it's a novel about men fighting. At the end of the day, I think women are portrayed from the perspective of a male in Los de Abajo or the underdogs. So that's just my take on that. Regarding intertextuality, okay, I was thinking about this as I was reading this novella. What can I compare it to? What other texts? And there are two important and favorite texts of mine from U.S. literature that I could put to dialogue with Los de Abajo. One of them is, of course, the great no novel by Hemingway, okay, For Whom the Bell Tolls. I've told you about this one already in a video, so if you want to hear more about it, I invite you to check that one out. And the other one is The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, another classic of fighting and war. I'm going in reverse chronological order right here. So if I were to compare the underdogs, for example, with For Whom the Bell Tolls, I would say that the underdogs is just incredibly fast-paced compared to this one, of course, okay? Because it is episodic. So all those moments of waiting, those philosophical discussions that you may find right here, Mariano Azuela skips them in Los de Abajo, and the result is that great uh, fast pace that Los de Abajo is known for. There are, however, ideas present in Los de Abajo, okay? So there are moments in which you are going to find uh, parts where it seems like it could be described for a moment, right, as a novel of ideas, but not the elaborate discussions of that that you find in For Whom the Bell Tolls. And then on the other hand, if we're looking at the dialogue with the Red Badge of Courage, I would say that if you compare the underdogs with this one, 
the underdogs is much more detached and much more objective especially on the part of the narrator than the red badge of courage is you're not going to find any intent in los de abajo or the underdogs to examine for example the psychology of demetrio but however there's a connection right here because also like crane okay azuela was very good at capturing dialect so you read the dialogues in uh, los de abajo or the underdogs and you're going to see that they are quite realistic they really capture the local color of how the characters speak so that is something that you could say that stephen crane was also very good at so you can find the connection right there now what kind of image does Los de Abajo present of the Mexican Revolution? Okay, I think that's an important uh, topic that we should discuss. There's a character named Antonio Solis, and I think he's the first one to offer important you know, uh, reactions to how he feels about the revolution. This is a character who is disillusioned, okay? And he's talking to, of course, Luis Cervantes, in uh, this is chapter let's see my Roman numerals as usual chapter 18 okay of the first part and uh, he's talking to Luis Cervantes and Luis Cervantes asks, asks him about how he feels about the revolution Antonio Solis says he is disillusioned and Luis Cervantes tells him you must have your reasons and then this is how Antonio Solis replies I had hoped for a flowery meadow at the end of the road but I found a swamp. This is a quote. We, we are not told where it comes from, but I remember back when I was a student um, reading this at the university, I actually found somehow, I don't even remember how, I found the source for that. It's from a poem by Juan Ramon Jimenez. That's why it sounds more grandiloquent in this context right here. And then he continues, my friend, there are men and events that are nothing but pure poison. Drop by drop, that poison enters the soul, tainting everything, making everything bitter. Enthusiasm, hope, ideals, happiness, nothing. There's nothing left afterward. Either one becomes a bandido like they are, or one disappears from the stage, hiding behind the walls of an impenetrable and ferocious egoism. The dialogue here is at a little bit of a higher level because of the character who is speaking. But you can hear the disillusionment that this character expresses right there. A little bit after that, the same characters are interacting and the narrator here offers from one of these characters a symbol of the revolution, as it is called right here. So it says, The same smile continued to wander as he followed the spirals of gun smoke and the dust of each demolished house and each sinking roof. And he thought he discerned a symbol of the revolution in those clouds of smoke and in those dust clouds ascending in a brotherly fashion, embracing each other, mingling and disappearing into nothingness. So the revolution is compared to a floating cloud, a cloud that just vanishes after a while. And then finally, we have a very important um, passage in which Demetrio himself is asked why he keeps fighting after all of this. This is towards the end of the novella when, you know, the morale is, is quite low and, and the fighters are, are already suffering. So, what are you still fighting for, Demetrio? He is asked. We get the narrator here. Demetrio, frowning deeply, distractedly takes a pebble and throws it to the bottom of the canyon. He remains pensive while he looks at the precipice and says, look at that pebble, how it keeps on going. So the idea is that he keeps fighting just in the same way that that pebble that, that is rolling cannot stop. Okay, there's just no way to stop. You know what I thought about when I read this little passage? I thought this was a kind of a weird association, or maybe not weird, but it was unexpected to me. It came out of nowhere, kind of. I thought of that movie, The Heart Locker by Catherine Bigelow, the, the very ending of that. I think you could compare the ending of that movie to this part of the novella, uh, The Underdogs, that takes place towards the ending also. This idea that it's almost an addiction, this fighting, right? That's why Demetrio cannot stop this uh, struggle that he is involved with. So I would say that overall, when it comes to the view of the revolution that this novella presents, there's really no romanticism whatsoever. But on the other hand, you don't have the opposite of that either. 
you have, I think, great objectivity. And I think that's one of the reasons why this novella has been beloved for so many years. So let me tell you now a little bit about the additions that I have. Back in the day when I was taking that class on the literature of the Mexican Revolution, we were kind of required to uh, get this edition right here. It's in Spanish, but it is thought for uh, students, like for students from coming from English who are reading this novel. It's by this novella, sorry. It's by Waveland Press, okay? And it has a very good introduction in English with details about Mariano Azuela, his life, his works, and also what they call a, um, let me give you exactly the word that they use, a vocabulary part, but it's kind of almost like a dictionary, okay? It's like lots of words right here uh, from the Spanish, so you have a little dictionary at the end to guide you with the reading. Now, if you're going to read this in Spanish, I'm going to say what I always say uh, regarding editions in Spanish, get the Catedra edition, okay? There is one. I don't have it, unfortunately. One day, if I see it, I'm going to buy it, but this is what they look like. I'm showing you the one for El Tunnel by Ernesto Sabato, of course. So, these editions are just amazing most of the time. They include really good introductions. Sometimes they have footnotes and everything. So, that's the one that I would recommend if you want to read Los de Abajo in Spanish. And then, if you want to read it in English as the underdogs, then there's just one edition to get, and it's this one. Okay, it's by Norton. The translation is by Alan Stavans and by Anna Moore. And this, as usual, okay, it's part of the Norton Critical Editions, so as usual, it comes with a lot of contextual and critical. Uh, essays and reactions to the novel has a very good introduction also if you want to look at the text the text itself of the novella is just that okay i don't know if you can see it but just that part that little part right there all of this other stuff is contexts it has some really really good um you know material right here like excerpts from for example from the book the wind that swept mexico so it gives you all the background of the mexican revolution and there's also an excerpt from the famous book by Octavio Paz, The Labyrinth of Solitude, that has to do with the Mexican Revolution also. And then, of course, you get some critical you know, reactions and some reviews. Uh, an essay, for example, by Clive Griffin on the structure of Los de Abajo and all that kind of stuff. So you know what I'm talking about. This is one of those editions that you read it and then you can kind of wear the t-shirt, you know? Ask me about, in this case, ask me about the underdogs or Los de Abajo. It's like you'll know everything there is to know about uh, the novella after you read this book. There were some typos, okay, which I thought was very strange because most of the time, if not all the time, it had to do with the names of the characters. So I thought that was weird, but other than that, it's an excellent edition and really an excellent translation also. I can tell you about that because I read the original in Spanish and I have also experienced it in English. So, you know what that means, right? Bottom line. The Underdogs is just one of the most effective novellas that I have ever read. It is simply unforgettable, I would say, as a story. And I think by focusing on the struggle itself and the people involved in the struggle, it probably tells you more about the Mexican Revolution than any history book would tell you. You know how it is. In a history book, you get the facts. You get the names of the historical people. You get the dates and all that kind of stuff. But this, on the other hand, is it, right? It's like the real thing. This is the way the revolution felt to people who were involved in them. And it was written by somebody who was directly involved in the Mexican Revolution. So I think that is really fascinating. It's priceless. And both in its content and in its form, this is an excellent text. So that is something quite rare that I think should be applauded. And I therefore think that this is a text that you can't miss. Have you read it? If you have, please let me know what you think. I would like to hear other opinions about it. And if you have not read it, you have no idea how I envy you, okay? I highly recommend it. I hope that you will read it. And if you do, please also let me know what you think about it. So, do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Those were my two cents on Los de Abajo or The Underdogs by Mariano Azuela, a great novella of the Mexican Revolution. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.